So, um, a billion people smoke um, in, in the world. And um, what's amazing is if we think about it, there's over 10 million cigarettes consumed every minute. So in the, in the world, 5 million deaths are occurring related to their smoking uh, behavior. And in the United States, it's over 400,000 people are dying every year. And it is the largest cause of preventable death um, in the United States. So what's really interesting is as we think about it, uh, cigarette consumption is really a 20th century behavior. Um, smoking really came about with the mass production and marketing of cigarettes. And smoking has, uh, consumption has decreased since the uh, Surgeon General report. But as we have had this incredible decrease in our smoking behavior um, over the uh, last 40 years, we've really leveled off our smoking. And uh, over the last decade, we've been fairly consistent with about 20% of uh, US adults who are current smokers. Adolescents continue to smoke, and even though we've been very successful in reducing their cigarette consumption, the um, teenagers are now moving into other types of nicotine products, um, hookah, the little cigarettes, um, the electronic cigarettes, and we really are thinking that these individuals are going to continue to transition to regular cigarette use. So even though we have had incredible social pressure, we've had policy changes, taxation, and heightened awareness about the health consequences of smoking, we've really kind of hit this um, number that is very stable with about 20% of the US population um, as current smokers. So, what I really want you to come away with is the idea that genetic variation really is driving how much uh, people smoke. So as, as I think of smoking behavior, there's the first point of never use, and then you transition to uh, whether you have your first puff or your first cigarette. And then you transition on to become a smoker, an individual who smokes 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. And it is this final step this, um, this transition from being a smoker to becoming nicotine dependent that is really driven by your biology. It's driven by uh, genetic variation um, in uh, both uh, your how you respond to nicotine and nicotine metabolism. So when we look at smoking behavior, people actually vary in their smoking behavior. They're the light level smokers that generally are not coming to medical attention. These are the individuals who uh, smoke just a few cigarettes a day. Uh, they're called chippers. They may not even smoke daily. Um, but the group that we see with the medical problems are the ones who have transitioned on with their smoking behavior and have become heavy nicotine dependent smokers. And the two questions that really capture this group of individuals who are the, those at greatest risk is how soon after you wake up do you smoke your first cigarette? And then how many cigarettes do you smoke per day? Both of those questions are important. The first one seems to be identifying a group that is undergoing withdrawal. You've just slept through the night. You haven't had a cigarette for many hours. And then the second is, is your dosage of how many cigarettes you're smoking per day. So, um, in this past decade, we really had a revolution in many of the genetic technologies, and uh, three very prominent publications came out in um, right around the end of the uh, lung cancer screening trials that were looking at um, is there variation in smoking behavior and is this variation related to um, underlying genetic predispositions? And the answer to this is absolutely yes. So this is what's called a Manhattan plot. Luckily, we're here in Manhattan. Um, and the way that this works in the genetic studies is um, on the x-axis are the chromosomes. So it's the uh, different types of chromosomes we have. They have the uh, 22 chromosomes. X and Y are not shown. And on the y-axis is the negative log of the p-value. So um, the higher it goes, the uh, more significant the finding. So there is this uh, locus on chromosome 15, p-value 10 to the minus 35, uh, very, very significant. 
and it contains the strongest genetic cont contribution that uh, gives an idea about how many cigarettes per day you smoke. What's interesting, underlying this very locus on chromosome 15 is the nicotinic receptor gene cluster. And um, it's the alpha-5, alpha-3, beta-4 nicotinic receptor subunit gene cluster. And what we have identified is that um, an amino acid, um, RS169, 69968, is this strongest genetic uh, risk for how much you smoke. It's located in the protein coding region of the alpha-5 nicotinic receptor, and it changes one of the amino acids in this receptor from a spare gene to aspartic acid. And this change seems to uh, alter how the, uh, the subunit, the nicotinic subunit, responds to nicotine and other types of agonists. So the second group that we think of as contributing to smoking behavior is nicotine metabolism. The P450 system on uh, chromosome 19 um, is the gene system that uh, primarily nic uh, metabolizes nicotine. Nicotine is metabolized uh, to cotinine, and the CYP2A6 gene does uh, the, the primary metabolism of that uh, from nicotine to cotinine. And we know that there, are, there is a natural variation in this gene. There are individuals who have reduced activity and others who have no activity of this gene. And if that occurs, then you must be uh, metabolizing nicotine through other me mechanisms. And as you are metabolizing nicotine through other mechanisms, your nicotine level in your body is higher. So we know those with the reduced metabolism, that they smoke fewer cigarettes per day, and they have greater success with smoking cessation. So um, just this year, there's been a beautiful longitudinal study that has um, examined kids uh, from uh, preteens and uh, fo has followed them up to about the age of 40 and is now starting to in integrate all of this type of genetic information along with behavior. And so looking at these two variants, the nicotinic receptors and nicotine metabolism, they could identify those at low risk and high genetic risk. Those who are at high genetic risk, if they initiate smoking, they convert more likely to becoming a daily smoker. Um, they transition through these conversions more rapidly. They go from initiation to heavy smoking much more quickly. When they become a heavy smoker, they persist in that behavior longer. Um, they, they are the ones who are most nicotine dependent, and they're the group that fails with many smoking cessation attempts. Now, I want to marry this work with um, the lung cancer data. So if we look at cigarette um, consumption in the United States, we see that it is um, really this 20th century behavior, and I would say that similarly, lung cancer and the um, incidence of lung cancer is, again, another 20th century um, disease. So since the 1964 Surgeon General Report, we've had this plateau and then decrease of smoking behavior, and what we see is the uh, lung cancer death rate really is mirroring uh, this, our, our consumption in the United States. So there's also been uh, several studies looking at uh, the genetic contributions of lung cancer. And as I showed the Manhattan plot for smoking behavior, if we look at the Manhattan plot for lung cancer, it really mirrors um, that same uh, genetic plot for smoking. So the greatest genetic risks for lung cancer are the genetic risks that are driving the smoking behavior. And not only is it nicotine receptor function, but it's also nicotine, a risk, nicotine metabolism that is driving this risk. So we could now start to tr uh, differentiate people uh, with their different uh, risks. So one of the key aspects of uh, the alpha-5 
um, nicotinic receptors and also the nicotine metabolism is that it is delaying smoking cessation. And uh, smoking cessation really is a behavior that often is not um, started until individuals reach their mid-20s to 30s, when they start to think, uh, it is time for me to quit smoking. And what we see is the one genetic variant on chromosome 15 that is predicting heaviness of smoking, predicting um, lung cancer, is also predicting a delay of smoking cessation. So if you look at the first quartile of people who quit smoking, there's a four-year delay just based on this one variant. As you move to the median quit age, the delay has been reduced to about two, two years. Well, what I think is really quite amazing about this genetic variant is that it is also predicting an earlier age of diagnosis of lung cancer. So in individuals who are uh, diagnosed with lung cancer, those with the high-risk genetic variant are being uh, are being diagnosed about four to five years earlier in their early 60s compared to in their mid-60s with the low-risk genetic variants. So I want to bring this now into smoking cessation. So clearly this behavior is, uh, contrib these genetics is contributing to smoking behavior, it's contributing to lung cancer, but then the key transition is how do we get these individuals who are nicotine dependent to quit smoking? So um, just a recent study that our group has had is that we've been able to look at individuals who uh, both are high risk for the alpha-5 nicotinic receptor and are at high risk for um, the nicotine metabolism gene. Um, and we could look at these individuals with their response to nicotine replacement therapy. So everyone in this study has received um, pharmacologic, count, uh, pharmacologic uh, uh, counseling um, and uh, or placebo and just counseling. And the uh, yellow group is the placebo group. And what you could see is those at the highest risk for both CHRNA5 and nicotine metabolism have the lowest abstinence rate at the end of treatment. But these individuals respond particularly well to nicotine replacement. So we just saw a number needed to screen for uh, CT scans with uh, lung cancer. And we could also look at a number needed to treat. So how many people do we need to treat before we see um, a, uh, res uh, how many people do we need to treat to have a positive response? So this is really quite remarkable that we could start identifying these genetic groups and in individuals who will respond to treatment. So even though we often feel that uh, disappointed with our pharmacologic treatment, in part that is because we have this wide range of uh, response. So we have a group that is essentially not responding to nicotine replacement therapy. That's the low-risk CHRNA5, low-risk nicotine metabolism. And then we have some groups with a uh, number needed to treat of 2.6. This high-risk group is actually uh, quite common. It is about 10% of smokers. And that is the group that I would say absolutely needs pharmacotherapy. So to put this in perspective, this is uh, data from our hospital but um, in, in St. Louis, but it, it really looks the same across the country. We could look at uh, um, admissions to the hospital and uh, who has smoked in the past 12 months. So we had almost 50,000 patients admitted to our hospital, and we could see uh, our overall smoking rate was about 30%. Um, on our psychiatry service, it was uh, almost 65%. So we then looked at who received pharmacotherapy for smoking cessation in the hospital. And our smoking cessation rate um, of pharmacologic treatment in the hospital is actually uh, quite low. Again, these numbers are no different from what is seen in other hospital systems, um, other reports, post-MI patients um, across really the United States. So in general, we know how to treat smoking. We know what improves care for smoking. 
but our hospital systems, our treatment um, uh, systems are not set up to really implement this. So um, in general, only about 20% of hospitalized patients are pharmacologically treated for their um, smoking. Um, and the one exception we have is actually on our psychiatry floor where we are getting about 70% of those individuals pharmacologically treated. So um, smoking behavior is changing. It's changed in the United States quite a bit over the past 100 years. Um, I think we are entering a whole new territory with electronic cigarettes. Um, I have no idea really what's going to happen with that, but it is a harm reduction therapy that we could think about of transitioning individuals from um, a regular uh, cigarette to the e-cigs. But this is really going to change our whole uh, kind of treatment algorithms going forward in the future. So I work with a lot of people across the United States, and uh, thank you very much.